Hello, everyone. How are you today? Yeah. Awesome. I, I want you to look at the person sitting next to you. Give them a huge smile. In fact, I want you to make it an even bigger smile. All right. Now look at them and ask them this question. Would you rather be phenomenal? Or would you rather be forgotten? Now I want you to look at them, give them a high five and say, I choose to be ph phenomenal. Awesome. Awesome. You know, one thing that I've realized about life is that ultimately it comes down to that question. Would you rather be phenomenal or would you rather be forgotten? In every organization, every country, every individual, every company ultimately makes that choice. Either consciously or subconsciously, deliberately or, or by default, we all make that choice. And as we spend the time, this, the next few minutes together, I want you to think about that. Think about that word phenomenal. And I chose that word very deliberately because there's no such thing as phenomenal lure, right? That phenomenal, you either are or you're not. An organization is or it's not. And what we're talking about is the top of the top, the cream of the crop, the best of the best. And as I think about this, this idea of being phenomenal, in other words, doing something significant, leaving a legacy, doing something that, that will be remembered. I like this, this image of, of a flame that burns really, really bright and that people can see it and it's something that's sustainable. That's phenomenal. On the other hand, forgotten is, is the match. And the only evidence that that match was here was that brief moment after it's blown out and you see that small trail of smoke. So ultimately, that's the decision that we have to make with our lives. We have to decide, do we want to be phenomenal or do we want or do we choose to be forgotten? This is uh, a picture of me. And, and by the way, for anyone who doesn't believe that you don't miss something until it's gone, trust me on this, all right? <laughs> trust me. <laughs> but I chose that picture because I was nine years old at the time. And this was actually a really important point in my life. This was actually when I first started speaking. And, and I should say that this was when I first started speaking publicly. Uh, I said that once and a guy looked at me and he said, nine, uh, you know, isn't that a little slow to start talking? <laughs> so I started speaking publicly when I was nine. And I knew that this was what I wanted to do. And for a number of reasons, I decided to choose a different path for my life, you know, listening to some advice, some great advice. And I decided I wanted to study accounting and ultimately be a CFO. Uh, and that's the chief financial officer of a really big company one day. And I was very fortunate. I, I had a great career. And that was a, something that I achieved in, you know, a really quick period of time, relatively speaking. I was 37 at the time. I became the chief financial officer. And what that means is I had financial responsibility for a $1.5 billion company. And the interesting thing is that I was, was really blessed with this great career. And the funny thing is that I knew deep down inside my heart that this was what I was meant to do because the best part of my job, no matter what job I had, was inspiring and, and developing the people who worked with me. My colleagues, my, the, peop, the people I led as a part of my team, some of my peers, and in other cases, people who were more senior to me in the organization, actually coaching them in specific areas such as executive communication. And I, I knew that this was what I wanted to do. And I remember I remember thinking as, as though it was almost as if I were reading from a script that wasn't written for me. Academy Award winning actor Clifton Anderson plays the world's most charismatic CFO. <laughs> Trapped in a career that wasn't for him, something had to give. In a movie filled with twists and turns and an ending you'll never see coming, Roger Ebert calls it spellbinding. Four stars raves the New York Times, co-starring Academy Award winning actress, 
Halle Berry. <laughs> hey, it's my movie. <laughs> and then you laugh like that couldn't happen. You know, that, that really, really hurts. <laughs> and around three years ago, I, I decided to, to really follow my purpose and passion of, of speaking. And I've had the opportunity, I've been very fortunate, even since I've moved into this space, to, to travel the world sharing my message about what it means to be phenomenal. And throughout my career, I, I was really fortunate to work in a lot of different industries and, and do consulting and, and be engaged by a lot of different industries. And, and really, since a very early age, I've also studied leaders. And when I, when I say leader, I'm not only talking about someone who leads a team, but I'm talking about people who lead their field, people who've done exceptional things in various fields. And based on all of these experiences, I've realized that all of these great organizations, all of these phenomenal organizations, all of these phenomenal individuals, they all have seven things in common. And as I, as I really looked at this, it really comes down to principles, priorities, perspective, personality, progress, people, and purpose. And one thing that, that you'll notice is that purpose is this big triangle, right? And the reason that is, is that purpose is the very foundation, and it really should serve as the backdrop for everything that we do. Every decision you make, every action you take, should serve a specific purpose. And all of you, or m many of you who are here in the audience are at an age where you're trying to decide what it is that you want to do with your life. When I was deciding on my career, I said I want to be CFO one day. So every job that I took, every project, all many of the books that I read were really aimed at helping me get to that place as quickly as possible. So let's talk about each of them. The idea of purpose says that we begin with, with the why. We begin with what it is, the reason that, that we're here. The reason, and I believe that each and every one of us showed up here for a very specific reason. I think that you have an assignment that has your name on it. And it might take, you might know exactly right now what it is that you want to do with your life. Or perhaps this might take some time. But my, my encouragement to you is to really think about what it is that you want to do. Think about what it is that you want to do, because in order to be, to do something significant, one of the things that I found is it takes being clear and crystal clear about our purpose. And Nietzsche said that if your why is big enough, you can overcome any how. So in other words, if you are crystal clear on your why and it is something that propels you, something that, that motivates you, something that inspires you, all of the obstacles that you face in your life won't really matter because you know that, that it, it's critical for you to make this a reality, whatever your purpose is. And that's exactly how I feel about the work that I'm doing. Principles is really about knowing where you stand. We, every day it seems, we read examples of people who have propelled or who have excelled in their career in various fields. And then all of a sudden something happens and that reputation that took years and years to build, very carefully craft this reputation of, of solid results, in some cases really extraordinary results, and in a moment all of it goes away because of a decision that was made, a poor decision. So what I want you to know about principles is that the time to decide what you stand for is before the test comes. The time to really understand what you will do and what you won't do is before you get caught up in the heat of the moment. So before all the emotion, before all the fear, before all of the, the negative emotions that come with that test, you want to make sure that you know what you stand for. So principles are very important. I actually wrote my personal mission statement. And this is a statement that I use. It's a page long, and I read a book entitled, and it's one of my favorite books by Stephen Covey, and it's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I read that years ago, actually around 20 years ago.
I read that book, and one of the things that I did as a result is I wrote a personal mission statement. And as Covey says, that it, that really should serve as your constitution. Just like in the U.S., we have a U.S. constitution, and every law that's passed, as he says, needs to be in, needs to be it needs to be in in conjunction with or in the context of that constitution, the same way as with your constitution. My personal mission statement, every decision that I make needs to be aligned and is aligned with that personal mission statement, knowing where you stand. Prioritizing or priorities is really focusing on what matters most. And there are a lot of temptations many times throughout the day to get you know focused on, on something else. You know, I, I think about all of the, the opportunities that I had and, and in some cases opportunities that I took, but if those were not important and, and really mission critical to where it was that I was going, I made a conscious decision not to do that. So prioritizing, deciding what's most important and focusing on those things. You know, one of the, the pieces of advice that you, that you'll see is, Focus on the five most important things every day. So write out a list. These are the five most critical things that I must do. So in, in addition to your schoolwork, decide what are those five things. Decide the night before or, per, or perhaps early that morning and make sure that you do those three to five things. Perspective is really about keeping the big picture in mind. Now, for, for those of you who've ever flown anywhere and you've experienced some turbulence, I'll tell you what I do whenever I'm on a flight, and I, I travel a lot. Whenever I, I'm on a flight and I, we experience some turbulence, I always look at the flight attendants. Because, you know, the thing that I've noticed is that if, if we hit some turbulence and they're smiling and they're still carrying along, going along their business, I know that everything is, is fine. But imagine if they started running down the aisles really quickly, pushing people out of the way. What kind of message would that send? So what I want you to think about is really asking yourself, what kind of message are you sending? Because people are looking up to you, and more and more people will look up to you. And what, what flight attendants do is they keep the big picture in mind. So in other words, because they fly so much, they, they can tell the difference between a minor bump and something that maybe is a bit more se severe. So keeping the picture in mind is, is really critical. There's another element of this, which is really around a positive mindset. And I want you to take a moment, and I want everyone to stand up, and I want you to look around the room, and I want you to look at everything blue in the room. So look for every shade of blue that you can see. All right, dark blue, look at the seats, look at the floor, look, at the, look all over the room, look at what people are wearing. Look at book bags, look at everything. Every shade of blue, dark blue, light blue, navy blue, blue blue, every shade of blue. All right, now have a seat. All right, now I want you to close your eyes. Right, everyone close your eyes. And I want you to visualize everything red in the room. All right, hard to do, right? Okay, open your eyes. Why is that? You took 30 seconds or so to look around the room. You looked all over the room. Now look around and look at the red that, that's around you, right? So we see different shades of red. In some cases, it's right beside you. Look at the, at the program. It's red, right? How many of you thought of that? Okay, so here's the thing that I want you to, to take away from this, that what we focus on the longest, as someone said, what we focus on the longest becomes the strongest. So throughout your day, if you're looking for opportunities, that's exactly what you're going to see. On the other hand, if you're looking for obstacles, that's exactly what you're going to see. There's something called the reticular activating system, and because we're bombarded with so much information throughout the day, it's very particular about what it allows in. So in this case, even though you saw the red, it didn't register because you were focused on something else. 
So imagine if the red were all of these great opportunities for you, because if you're not focused on those opportunities, if you're not looking for them, they'll pass you by. Otherwise, in, they'll be there in every shade and every color. Personality is really knowing yourself. It's being clear about what you do well and what you don't do well. And as you enter your careers, you'll have the opportunity, in, in a lot of cases, to get feedback from some of your colleagues. This might be the manager that you work for. This might be some of the peers that you work with. But one of the things that we all must do is ask ourselves, what am I good at? You know, what are the things that I, uh, that I excel at? Develop those gifts. And then be clear about the things that you're not so good at. So I have a, a really quick story. I was uh, working in Brazil uh, for a couple of years with the company. And I went down there. I had never sung karaoke before. And a lot of people think I can sing because of my, my voice. So I was working with this, this group of people in a different city. I go down. And we go out after work to celebrate someone's birthday. And we go to this place that's, uh, that has karaoke. So they're singing. Most of the songs are in, in Portuguese. And I'm just listening and you know having a good time. And then they put on Unforgettable, which is an old song by Nat King Cole. And I say, Clifton, come up and sing. So I get up and I sing. And halfway through the song, there's an instrumental break. And people are already clapping. And then by the end of the song, most of the restaurant stands up and gives me a standing ovation. So all of a sudden, karaoke is my favorite thing to do, <laughs> right? So every weekend, I'm out and singing karaoke at different places. And it's always the same response. And then I was promoted to a role back in Pennsylvania. And someone, I decided to take my team, my new team, to uh, out to sing karaoke, really as a team building activity. And we go out. And I let, you know, some of them sing first. And then when I get up, I do Unforgettable. And after I finish, I get the polite little tennis clap. And I'm thinking, do you, do you know who I am? <laughs> I'm huge in Brazil. Do you know who I am? And it wasn't until I went back to Brazil a couple of weeks later to tr train the person who, who replaced me. And one of my colleagues, when I had worked there, had a, a party at his house. It was a birthday party. And he had a karaoke machine. And during the party, I'm talking to one of his neighbors in Portuguese for about half an hour about politics, about sports, about pretty much everything. And then they put on New York, New York. And I say, Clifton, come up and sing. So I go up and sing. And then it dawned on me, because later my friend told me what happened. He said that while I was up singing New York, New York, this guy that I've been speaking to in Portuguese leans over and says, wow, that guy speaks English really, really well. And then it dawned on me that the reason I got all of the applause wasn't because I could sing really well. They thought I was a Brazilian going up and singing these American songs with absolutely no accent. <laughs> so now I don't sing karaoke anymore. <laughs> it's not as fun. <laughs> but here's the point in that story, is that as I think about it, no one ever told me that I could sing, maybe with the exception of my mother. So I probably should have known that this was not necessarily something that I was good at. And as I was listening, I, you know, I, if I honestly said, I said, oh, OK, I sound all right. But I'm no Nat King Cole. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not that great. But because I was getting that feedback, it suggested something else. But deep down in my heart, I knew that wasn't something. So what the, the message here is that deep down in your heart, you know the things that you're good at. In a lot of cases, it's based on feedback. But in a lot of cases, it's just based on how you feel, you know, when you're doing that. Stretching yourself is really progress. So set a goal for yourself and set goals for yourself. And I, I like the, the expression that someone says, set goals that scare you. Be very, very aggressive in the goals that you set for yourself. Be realistic. You know, there's a, a um, acronym. It's called SMART uh, Goals. You can look that up, but it's very, uh, there are five different attributes that every goal should have. So as you think about what it is that you want for yourself and the goals that you set for yourself, Ask yourself, how am I doing relative to my goals? How am I doing? And, and always monitoring the progress. In order to, to get exceptional results, we have to know what it is that we want, and we have to hold ourselves accountable and make sure that we're measuring our progress toward that goal. Finally is around people. 
And this is around the people you surround yourself with or assembling a world-class team. I want you to think about the most significant accomplishment throughout history. And this can, you can go as far back as, as ancient history or as recently as early this morning. Anything that is, is considered historical, right? Think about the most significant accomplishment throughout history. And I want you to think about the person who was responsible for that. The one person who was responsible for it. All right. So as you think about that, what I'll tell you is that I can guarantee you that if it's truly a significant accomplishment, that person didn't do it by him or herself. That in order to do anything significant, it requires people. So think about the, the pyramids, for instance. You know, one of the, natu the, the, um, one of the wonders of the world. You can think of the pharaoh or you can think of the architect, but those people individually, they didn't do that by themselves. It took a lot of people. So in order to, to do something phenomenal, one of the things that we have to realize is that it's going to require other people to do that. And as a friend of mine, Christy Fernandez says that if your dream is something that you can accomplish alone, then you're not dreaming big enough. You're not dreaming big enough. So let's talk about this, this concept of ideas. The theme here is, is making ideas happen. And what we know is that idea is inspiration developed early and acted upon. Because ultimately, an idea is just an idea. And, and someone said this very interesting quote, that ideas are cheap and abundant. Execution is everything. So in order to make that idea phenomenal, whatever idea it hap that, that it happens to be, in order to make it phenomenal, action has to be taken. You have to execute that in order to make that a reality. And as I close, I, I want to share one of my favorite poems. It's by Christopher Loeb, and it's called Come to the Edge. Come to the edge. We might fall. Come to the edge. It's too high. Come to the edge. And they came, and he pushed, and they flew. We need you to come to the edge. Your families need you to come to the edge. Your country, your community, they need you to come to the edge. And believe me, now more than ever before, this world needs you to come to the edge. As someone said, that if you're not living life on the edge, you're taking up too much space. You were born to do phenomenal things. You were born to do extraordinary things. Go make them a reality. I invite you, I encourage you, I urge you to be phenomenal. Thank you.